One of the most vivid memories of my childhood was when I was perhaps 10 or 11 years old. We were living in Kenya at the time, and my parents brought me to Cape Town on holiday. And we came down onto this beach, and I was totally amazed to see these huge meters long seaweeds, the biggest seaweeds I've ever seen, and they're the biggest seaweeds in the world, actually. And these are kelps. Now, kelps are an iconic feature of temperate regions around the world, and particularly here in the southwestern Cape of South Africa. So this morning we're going to take a closer look at kelps, what they are and how they're structured. So this is the most iconic and most familiar species of kelp that you get here. It's the sea bamboo, and we've got a nice, freshly washed up little group of them here. So I'm just going to untangle them and show you just how enormous they are. And quite heavy. Well, I think we're going to have to... <laughs> Just let me catch my breath here. Oh, well, here we've got a fantastic specimen that, that's just washed up here because actually not only has it got these huge kelps, but we've got both the common species here. So I can show you the differences between them. This longer specimen here, uh, which widens out at the end and has a narrow base, that's the sea bamboo. So if we look at the structure of the plant, the bottom end of the plant is actually attached firmly to the rocks by a structure that's called a holdfast. It looks very much like the roots of a land plant, but it has a completely different function. So the roots of a land plant actually go into the soil and absorb nutrients and absorb water and transport those up into the plant. In these seaweeds, of course, they're already in the water and in the nutrients, so those are just absorbed through the leaves. The hold fast is just here to do exactly that, to hold it fast, to stick it solidly down onto the rocks. So it's got these root-like structures which are very sticky and it's firmly attached to the rocks here. So these holdfasts actually are complicated little habitats on their own and a whole range of different little invertebrate species live inside these holdfasts. They're very rich little faunal patches. Emerging from the holdfast is the stalk or stipe of the kelp and that carries the leaves or fronds up to the water surface. And in these plants then the stipe is actually hollow. So it starts off very narrow at the bottom end and then as it grows towards the surface it expands into a wide bulb here and this bulb is hollow and filled with gas so it's a float it's a flotation device actually and it just buoys up the kelp plant to the surface and makes sure that the fronds receive the maximum amount of light and can photosynthesize from the top of the stipe of the of the kelp emerge these fronds, leaf-like fronds, that emerge laterally to the side. And they're very, very long. Some of these can be two or three meters long. And what's happening here is that the growth point is down at the base here. So these fronds are being generated at a rate of about a centimeter a day. And they're moving conveyor belts of tissue. So the youngest tissue is at the bottom here, and it's growing upwards. And then, after a certain period of time, it just erodes off at the ends. It gets old, it gets flapped around in the water, and it just erodes away. It's like you've got your spring leaves at the base, and then the autumn leaves at the end, and they That's fall exactly, off. That's exactly, yes, they don't fall They stay, the same frond stays on the kelp for its entire life. It's just growing at the base and eroding off at the end. Cool. And this material that erodes off from the end actually provides food 
for a whole lot of other filter feeding animals. So kelps are very important like that in the ecosystem. They're generating little kelp particles into the water that are feeding all sorts of animals. And is that photosynthesis also uh, giving us oxygen? It's using up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. Similar so to trees. These are, yeah, they're really good things for global warming and so on. They have a very high rate of photosynthesis because they're being kept, they're constantly wet, they're in the water, and they're being kept at optimal photosynthetic conditions right up at the surface by this bulb. And we can cut this bulb in half, and then we can see the cavity. So this cavity is filled with gas, and that's what buoys the kelp plant up to the surface. So people also use these kelp bulbs to make kelp horns, or they can use them as a receptacle to bry their meat in, to cut it open, put your bry meat inside, plug up, up the hole, and then you put the thing on the bry fire if you've got your pot. <laughs> I've noticed that these uh, kelp types, when they get washed up on the shore, they get eaten. Yes, so an enormous amount of kelp gets washed up on the shore. On this particular beach, about one ton of kelp for each meter of beach gets washed up every year and that provides a huge amount of nutrition to all sorts of uh, beach animals like beach hoppers and isopods and the birds that feed on those. They're very important for beach ecology. So we shouldn't be cleaning them up off the beach, they actually need to be left there? <laughs> not really, I mean they are, I, I guess, not very nice to sit around. So I can understand that in popular bathing beaches you might want to remove them. But in more remote beaches like this, it's better to leave them behind and provide food for all those animals. Important part of the ecology. Yes, and saves money too. Let, let the beach amphipods do the cleaning for you. So all the kelp plants that you can see when you look out into the ocean that, is, that are up on the water surface, they're all this species, which has this uh, buoyant bulb that brings the front to the surface. But there is also another very common kelp species. This is the second species of kelp that we get here. You notice that it's got a much thicker stipe. So there's no buoyancy here, there's no bulb at the top. So these kelps don't extend to the water surface. They're basically the understory of the kelp forest. They only grow to a length of about three or four meters and they live below the sea bamboos. So if we cut through the stipe here, you can see that this one is solid as opposed to the sea bamboo, which had a big cavity in the center. It's a thicker, more solid stem. So here we can see that the split fan kelp just has a single front, which near its origin here is divided into a whole lot of fingers, like a comb or a fan. And again, each one of these fronds is being generated at the base here. And as we move down the front, we're moving into older and older front material. And then it erodes away at the end. This is actually also a very effective mechanism for stopping other seaweeds and other animals growing on the kelp. Because if they start to grow, they just get moved to the end of the kelp front and then they fall off. They get like mini, mini seaweeds which grow on them, right? Yes. So they're, particularly on the stem, on the stipe of uh, many of these kelps, you get several species of seaweed that only occur in that habitat. So they only grow on kelps. Are they like parasitic? <laughs> They're taking advantage of the fact that the kelp is buoying them up towards the water surface and providing more photosynthetic opportunities for them. But they're not actually stealing nutrients from the kelp plant. And on this particular individual, you can see we've got some epiphytic algae growing on here. Here we've got a third species of kelp. This is called the bladder kelp. It still has a holdfast, very much like the holdfasts of the other kelps, but the stipe is extremely long and thin. It can be 20 or 30 meters long. And at regular intervals along the stipe, there's a corrugated little frond here. And at the base of each frond, there's a bladder, an air-filled bladder that keeps the whole thing afloat. So in South Africa, this species is actually very scarce and is only found at a couple of sites. But this is the genus of kelp that you get, for example, in California. So in the rest of the world, there are big beds of this. 
So I don't see any flowers or anything on these kelp plants. How do they reproduce? Yes, kelp plants reproduce in algae in general, in fact, reproduce in a totally different way to flowering plants. So there's no flowers, there's no pollen, there's no seeds. What we do have in uh, seaweeds is we've got two distinct phases of the life cycle, two different organisms. So this organism, this big kelp that we see, is called the sporophyte, and it produces millions and millions of spores along its front. And those spores settle on the sea floor and develop into an entirely different tiny little organism called the gametophyte. And the gametophytes have males and females. The males produce sperm and the females produce eggs. And those join together and grow back into the kelp plant again. So it has like two reproduction cycles in its life Two cycle. entirely yeah. different reproduction cycles. Uh, and uh, ferns do very much a similar type of thing. And whereabouts does that small life cycle happen? Is it that it's on deep? the It's on the sea floor. Yeah. So they settle on the rocks and on everything in their very large numbers. And the vast majority of them are eaten by filter feeders or grazers. And a few manage to produce sperm and eggs and then grow back into this enormous kelp plant. So the, the two phases of the life cycle completely different in size and completely different in appearance. You would never recognize them as being part of the same organism. Where's my boy? You want to cheat? You want to sit? Hey, dog. Where's a good dog? Because you're just interested in the treats, aren't you?